Hello and welcome to Deep Macro's Future of Finance podcast. I'm very happy uh, to have with me today Francesco Giovassi. Uh, Francesco is a professor of economics at Bocconi University and a regular visiting professor at MIT. Uh, his list of achievements is very, very long, and I will just name a few. Most recently, he was a government economic advisor to the government of Prime Minister Mario Draghi. Previously, he has been a member of the Group of Economic Policy Advisors to the President of the European Commission under Jose Manuel Barroso. Francesco has also advised central banks and finance ministries all throughout Europe, and he remains on many high-level research groups. He also writes a popular editorial for the daily newspaper Corriera della Sera, which I'm sure I mispronounced, um, which is Italy's largest circulation newspaper. So anyway, thank you, Francesco, for appearing with us today. Um, thank you for inviting. Yeah, no problem. Um, I thought we could start with, uh, could you describe your role in the Draghi government? This is not a common position, say, in the U.S. No, uh, the, the prime minister, actually, more than the government itself, has a personal economic advisor uh, with whom he discusses and makes all economic uh, related decisions. And uh, that's the role I had for the two years of the drug administration, so, which means uh, I think we did three main things in these years. One was the vaccination campaign, because we, when, when we took office in mid-February 2020, vaccination in Italy hadn't yet started, and within a few months we were able to speed them up. Second was uh, the war, which started um, in a year after. When the vaccination campaign was running, the war came, and from an economic point of view, the main effect of the war was the jump uh, in inflation due to gas prices, because the gas prices went from 30 euro to whatever uh, measure of gas you use to 300, so it was a factor 10. And third was fiscal policy to avoid the collapse of aggregate demand. So aggregate demand had fallen by almost 10%, 9 point something in 2020. And in 2021, by acting fast, uh, we had demand recovered by 10%, so almost canceling the negative effect of 2020. Okay. So these were the main three things. Okay, did. wonderful. Um... A lot of these were somewhat reactive to events, at least uh, the vaccination campaign, the war, um, and then I guess inflation as well. Um, what about on the structural side? Uh, there is an image that um, the Italian system is very difficult to reform structurally. Um, do you think that's true? Is it worse than any other countries? And if so, why? It is difficult everywhere. Uh, it was more difficult in, in our specific experience for two reasons. One, which is structural, because uh, to uh, have it, to run a reform, you need to address vested interest and to uh, to kill vested interest, which in Italy is particularly difficult for one reason. Italy is an aging society, and the more um, the society ages, the more the average person doesn't see a long future ahead of herself because his uh, the average age is high, and so she or he tries to protect whatever he has. So it's a society where the protecting what you have, which is your interest, is much stronger than in a young society that is growing fast. That's why it's very difficult. In many aging society in Italy, in particular Japan, would be, would be another example. Um, the second in, uh, reason is that if you want to, uh, to uh, impose reform where they're not very popular, you need a strong popular mandate. And the technical government, like Mario Draghi's government, uh, can do the best plans. But the moment comes when you go down in parliament and an MP uh, raises her hand and says, Professor, how many votes did you get last time? I got half a million. How many did you? You say, well, I didn't run the election. Say, let, let me do it, she would say. And that's the killing moment of any, of any reform. And so I guess that's important because I think, you know, possibly people have forgotten that, um, as you mentioned, it was a technical government. Uh, the prime minister was not an elected politician. Um, how uh, this is something that has happened in Italy you know, before. Um, is there could you go through the background of how the government came into being and uh, maybe some of the specifics about um, why it was uh, it eventually fell? <laughs> 
So uh, the government came into being, so there had not been an election, and there was a parliamentary majority, which had as the largest party, uh, 30% of parliament, the Five Star Movement, which is uh, a, <clears throat> a reaction, a populist, a really populist party, but they had 30% of the seats. Uh, and then the president, uh, asking Mario Draghi to form a government, asked to form a coalition government that would uh, bring together most, if not all, uh, parties present in the government. And uh, uh, we got all the pa- all the parties except one. There was only one party in the opposition, which, not surprising, is the only part is the party now leading the government that came after us, the right wing party by uh, of Mrs. Meloni. So the previous government uh, had a lot of infight. They couldn't get uh, a lot done, and uh, it essentially gave up. So there was a fight between uh, the right of the party, the Northern League, and the populist Five Star. And the result is that the uh, government imploded, and the president asked Mario Draghi to, because what the president didn't want to do was to have another election. He wanted to get to the end legislature. Uh, there, were, there were two more years, and so he said, try to get to the end. Now, why we didn't get to the end? We did one year, one year and a half, but then the as we get we got close to the election, the parties were about to run the election, understood that the more uh, Draghi would be prime minister, the more he would become powerful, the more difficult it would have been to kick him out. So the their view was get rid of him the, f- the, the faster you can. I see. Okay. Um, just a little bit off the topic, but um, you mentioned that the populist, uh, um, the five star movement, was in the government. Um, uh, we read a lot about populism, um, but you've actually worked with, um, you know, a fairly major uh, populist party. Um, was there anything specific? Uh, uh, that was really different when it really came down to policy and governing um, about this uh, fairly large, uh, influential populist party? Well, one problem was that the quality, uh, it's not nice to talk about people, but the, the quality of the people in the government was not very high. Uh, this is a party that has as its um, trademark the idea that uh, one person is equal to another person. There should not be distinction among people depending on their achievement, on their education. So there were very good people in government. Uh, For example, Minister Cingolani was in charge of energy, a very delicate issue during the government, was an excellent physicist, although he was brought in by the Five Star, but others were uh, were very weak, which meant you had to... Uh, spend a lot of try- time trying to convince them, not they were uh, theoretically or politically opposed, they, they didn't, and it took very a long time to get them to, to understand. Uh, and then there was the right, uh, the Northern League, which is a right-wing populist party, very different, uh, that the problem with the Northern League, and uh, it came from a period where it had been very close to Russia and to Putin and they actually had been uh, financed by Putin during the previous campaign. Now, we were entering a war with Putin, so that was very difficult. It took some time to convince the League and their leader, uh, Salvini, that uh, the world has changed. Putin now was not, uh, could have, or no, should not be their friend anymore, so that was very difficult to manage. I can see. Um... So then uh, returning to structural reform, um, if there's a textbook Econ 101 approach, it's to implement the market reform and then to compensate the losers, uh, especially with fiscal benefits. Does this formula work in the real world, not just the textbook? Um, In principle, it's right, but it's very difficult. Let me give you uh, one example where we failed. Um, In Italy, uh, the seashore beaches are... um, can be um, at all public and can be rented out to um, to private entrepreneurs who then run the beaches. It's not like the US where the beach is open for every, the government or the uh, municipality can rent them out. So what happens in Italy is that most of the beaches, especially the very nice ones, uh, 
had been rented out 50 years ago at the price of 50 years ago, uh, never uh, adjusted. So you go to Fort Le Marmi, which is a very well-known beach in Tuscany, uh, where if you uh, get a seat on a weekend on the month of August, you pay a few thousand dollars for two people, and the whole beach is rented out for the year at ten thousand dollars. So this you want to change, but the rent that accrues to those vested interests is so large that it's very easy, difficult to compensate. And there is a limit; uh, you you cannot compensate unlimited, right? Because you are giving uh, a too large amount of money. So this small but concentrated interest group, I was. The other well-known to any tourist who goes to Italy in this month is taxi drivers. Uber does not exist in Italy, which means that if you land in Rome and you want a taxi to go from the airport to downtown Rome, uh, it's complicated. But again, uh, those few taxi drivers have such a large rent, they're compensating them. I mean, in principle, you can give them as much money as you want, but you want to impose a limit upon yourself. So it's is right. The idea of compensating is correct, but doing it in a way that is politically acceptable is very difficult. Okay. Um, on that theme, uh, a couple of years ago, you wrote a book, um, I believe it was called Austerity, Where It Works and When It Doesn't, or When It Works and When It Doesn't. Um, could you summarize the arguments uh, in that book, please? And are we in a world where fiscal or this debate is relevant at all? It just doesn't seem like there is much attention paid to fiscal uh, austerity uh, these days. Yeah, the book made made a simple point, and probably the title was not the best to <clears throat> um, explain the point. The point was about how to implement austerity. If you want to reduce the budget deficit, there were two ways to do it. You raise taxes or you cut spending. And what we document in looking at uh, 30 years of data in uh, about 20 large uh, countries in the world is that if you do it by cutting spending is much less costly than if you do it by raising taxes. If you uh, reduce the budget by raising taxes, you almost always get a recession, which means that the debt to GDP ratio goes up because GDP collapses. If you do it by cutting um, spending, uh, they're trying to protect groups, population that are particularly weak, you can uh, reduce the deficit without creating a recession. That was the main point. The book did not address maybe the more difficult issue is when should you implement austerity, which is what you're asking. Um, there are moments, and certainly when we're in government 21, 22, um, is when you don't want to implement austerity because the economy had just been hit by a huge shock, which is uh, the pandemic, which reduced GDP by 10% just in a single year, there what you want to do is to support income uh, of households, support companies whose um, balance sheet had, had collapsed, because if you allow the companies and households to collapse, then the economy is collapsing. So you have you, last moment you want to do, to do austerity. Then you have it, then the debt to GDP jumps up, during the Draghi government, the GDP jumped from 130% to 150%, a 20% increase in debt, but because GDP fell 10%. But then in 22, uh, GDP went up 9%, so part of the uh, what happened during the pandemic was reversed. So it's an example that you don't want to implement austerity when the economy is already under stress because of a shock. And in a, in a, because of a shock, right. Okay, good. Um, so I want to shift to the euro area as a whole. You've been an advisor to um, both the uh, uh, the ECB and to many of the uh, member central banks, finance ministries throughout the region and other parts of Europe. Um, the euro crises uh, seem to come and go, and the ECB does a pretty good job of dealing with them. Um, but do you think that, uh, that this is a healthy environment where um, it seems that a lot of the uh, people rely on the ECB quite a lot. Do you think that this is sustainable um, or do you think uh, that there are specific things that need to happen in European integration to take some of the burden off the central bank? Unfortunately, it, it is not sustainable. We've been lucky in the first 20 years of the euro to make it, uh, but I think 
the moment has come where I have to recognize that monetary policy alone uh, cannot solve the problem. And fiscal policy has to come in and help monetary policy. So what really uh, we lack in Europe is a central fiscal capacity. So you cannot have the economy run only based on, on monetary policy. And especially during the pandemic, it became very clear that we need fiscal action, which did happen uh, because um, in, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, the European Union created um, the what was called the Next Generation EU program, which is a very large fiscal program financed by the EU, so it was not individual countries financing the program themselves, but mostly it was the EU financed the program and using the money to address at the time uh, the pandemic, later the war in Ukraine. Monetary policy would have been uh, unable to do that. So um, monetary policy can run uh, when when the water is uh, is calm and the winds are soft, but a moment comes when you need fiscal policy to help monetary policy. We are there now, and uh, as you know now, the EU is discussing a new, fis a new set of fiscal rules, the so-called new Stability and Growth Pact. Um, we will come; it has to be agreed upon by Christmas, uh, but that will not be enough. I, I think that the experiment we had with Next Generation EU um, has to continue because more and more we'll need a central fiscal capacity. There are big issues to be addressed in Europe. One is climate change, another way is spending for defense, and the third is spending for refugees coming from Northern Africa. Uh, monetary policy can do very little about that. So, and each individual country, maybe with the exception of Germany, is too small to be able to address this problem by itself. So we need something that is done together, and the central fiscal policy is what is, what is needed. It won't be difficult, it won't be easy. So there are many opposition to the center of fiscal supply, but the fact that the next generation EU was in place and it's working, it's a first sign. Okay. And would you say, I mean, traditionally the idea has been um, that, you know, that, that that's uh, necessary in order to make the union work better. Uh, but um, again, getting back to the political side, uh, there have been populist movements, others that are simply opposed to transferring these rights up into um, the EU. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the, the person on the street in Italy, um, how they think um, about, uh, about the EU, about the Euro itself. Uh, I find it sort of hard to see here. Um, a lot of times there's, uh, uh, you know, beliefs that um, very anti-Euro um, uh, in certain cases would like to exit the Euro, et cetera. Uh, but how do you think the average person on the street in Italy thinks toward um, the union? Yeah, I think it, it depends uh, what they what they see. So for a long time, for most of 20 years, uh, the first part of the euro, um, what the men in the street or the women in the street would see is a tough com European commission hitting on the countries in Italy in particular because they were not doing something right. So if someone keep hitting you because you're not doing something right, at some point you say, forget about these guys. Now we, we, we do it the way we want. What has changed uh, with the pandemic is that everybody was scared to death with the, uh, with, with the COVID crisis. And then you came in and said, don't worry, we are going to help you. We are going to help you with distribution of vaccines, uh, with access to vaccines. And we're going to help you in... Uh, transfer to households that have lost their jobs. And for the first time, they saw that the EU was doing something useful for them. Um, when I was going around uh, Italy, explaining in various cities from the north to the south what the next generation EU program would be doing, uh, the ideal example was to go to a town, say Padova, near northeast, near Venice. Uh, Padova had a problem for, I guess, 50 years, that there is the, the train, the main train line goes through the center of the city. Padova is a wonderful medieval city, which is ruined in the center by this train line and this ugly station in the middle. Then you could tell them, look, we never had the, the neither the money, nor the political determination to do it. Now the next generation new program tells us you have to do it, start from Padova, uh, have a new 
modern uh, train station under the uh, soil. And so the city uh, above is no longer cut in two by the train. And people were understood with this simple example. This happened that uh, Europe can also do something good for you, both in terms of financing and in terms of breaking the vested interest that if you do it by yourself are difficult to break. So it's a question of how you see um, Europe from the point of view where you are in Italy or France or another country. Okay. I want to shift to uh, inflation for a second. Um, Inflation snuck up on uh, the ECB and basically mobbed it, uh, kind of like it did the Fed. Um, Has it hurt the ECB's credibility or, let's say, support for the euro project itself in countries like Germany? Okay, what hurt, what, what the, the bad thing about inflation in, in Europe, which was very different from inflation in the US, is that uh, politicians were very, were very slow to understand the source of inflation. So in Europe, as opposed to the US, inflation was not a demand shock. In the US, it was a demand shock due to the uh, large fiscal expansion of the Biden administration when it took office. In, in Europe, there was no fiscal expansion. The level of aggregate demand uh, before COVID didn't change, but there was a large supply shock because, as I said uh, at the beginning, the price of gas went from 30 to 300. And of course, since Europe runs mostly on gas, the shock the supply side was enormous. Um, I must say that the Draghi government and Macron also understood that almost immediately that to address the shock and to avoid inflation from going from zero to 10%, you had to put a cap on gas prices. That was possible and eventually it did happen. So the shock came at the end of February 21. By December 21, there was a cap on gas prices. They promised 10 months for a very long time. And by the moment the cap came and the price of gas went from 300 down to not to 30, but to 50, Inflation had already started, and then it's difficult to stop. And then when the ECB had to come in. So I think the mistake was not to realize that it was a shock that could have been avoided or stopped um, by stopping the rent that Russia essentially, because most of the gas in Europe was coming from Russia, was uh, well, the shock of the, the rent of the crew into Russia because of the huge uh, increase in gas prices. The ECB did what it could, but uh, it was it was not the best instrument to do because the ECB could not act on gas prices. Right, and I mean the Italian government. You mentioned at the beginning, uh, this is one of the three things that you were uh, tasked with advising, and that the government uh, was one of their achievements. Maybe you could go into a little bit more uh, detail about what exactly uh, within Italy uh, you did, if you could explain that whole situation one more time, because it seems that uh, you're providing a government role for combating inflation in addition to uh, the central uh, role that most economists and people in the market give to central banks. Yeah, I think this is one of the things I learned that uh, you have, there are many instruments that economic policy can use. Uh, Simply using monetary policy, as I said, is fine if you uh, ride in very calm waters. But when you have a shock, you have 10 instruments you can use, try to use all of them. Otherwise, maybe some are, are useless, but it's one more, right? So the in the case of um, of the war and of the increase in gas prices, it was obvious that it was a mistake to try to use money. It was not a question of that demand, like in the US, had increased too much. You had to kill access, excess demand to reduce inflation. It was not an excess demand problem. It was a supply shock due, as I said, to the fact that gas prices had gone to 300. And when all your gas comes from Russia, and Russia has very little alternative use for gas because Russia has a number of large pipes coming to Western Europe, and then a very small, not yet completed pipe that goes to China. So when we uh, introduced the cap on on gas prices, what uh, Putin did was uh, for, for some time, for a little while, he accumulated gas, but gas is not something you can accumulate easily. At some point, he was burning gas, um, which from an ecological point of view is a disaster, but also for a political point of view, because Russia was in a mess. And if you see your only source of uh, wealth burning in the sky, you are not very happy. Uh, 
So we did that at Christmas. We should have done that in February. And that was a mistake. But the monastery policy could do nothing about that. And would you... Um, you also have written, I think, about the role between or the, the shock and inflation expectations. Um, was this successful at cutting the link between an oil price or an energy shock um, and inflation expectations overall? Well, again, it's, it's the same problem. So inflation was very low, was below 2% uh, when the war erupted. Um, then... The big uncertainty was how long is going to how prices jumped up, price of energy jumped up immediately. Is it going to be a temporary shock or is it going to last? So that's when inflation expectations started to move. And then when the if you look at the uh, numbers and expectations, when the price cap was introduced, expectation went down a lot. But it was too late. So the whole problem is that we waited too long. Why? Because Europe is a democratic uh uh, construction. You, uh, you have 27 countries, you have to convince all of them. You cannot just let one in the side. Uh, there is, on these big issues, there is no majority rule. You have to convince everybody because only one country that says no in the European Council can block. And the, the amount of work you have to do. So we convinced France in two weeks. So we had a co common plan with Macron in a couple of weeks. Then we went to uh, to Germany, uh, Scholz has a uh, has an excellent economic advisor, a guy who got a PhD in finance at Chicago and then worked at Goldman Sachs and then went to work. With he understood immediately. But then you have to go around Europe and convince the Dutch, convince the, um, the Estonians. It's very difficult. In the end, you do it. But time goes by and time was at the essence. So there is nothing the ECB could have done. Right. Okay. Well, um, you mentioned that you're back to teaching and enjoying it. It sounds like um, perhaps uh, uh, what you teach is uh, modified a little bit um, in terms of what monetary policy can do uh, and the role for uh, for government um, action. Would you say that that's pretty fair? That uh, your experience uh, right at the you know at the center of the government has altered uh, the way that you uh, think and teach. Yeah, in two, um, in many dimensions, but in what we discussed today, in two very specific dimensions. One is some, um, uh, in my view, wrong ideas that I also had, uh, that monetary policy is all powerful. I think economists are very um, keen to think that uh, the central bank is all powerful. I must say also because central banks do a lot of research, they're very close to economy, academic economists, so we, we think they are the obvious partners. They are not. The example I gave you on the uh, gas price shock, there was nothing the central bank could do. Uh, they have to try to understand there are, there are more instruments. And second, that there are some um, strong views that are also wrong. Another strong view is that debt is always a disaster. I mean, we prefer a country with low debt. But there are situations when the economy is collapsing that increasing debt is not a disaster. What really matters is the uh, difference between the cost of debt, the interest rate that the government pays on debt, and the growth rate. So if R is below G because you are able to keep the growth rate uh, positive, then even if debt goes up by a bit, you, it is not worried. It's when the economy collapses and interest rate jumps up that you should worry about that. And that is not always the case. While I think a popular view, certainly the traditional newspaper's view, is that when they see debt going up, it's always a disaster. We have to be careful because sometimes you address a disaster with austerity at the wrong time, in the wrong way by raising taxes, and then you make the disaster worse. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much uh, for joining us today, Francesco. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. The content is for informational purposes only. You should not construe any such information or other material as legal, tax, investment, financial, or other advice. Nothing contained in this material constitutes a solicitation, recommendation, endorsement, or offer by Deep Macro Incorporated or any third-party service provider to buy or sell any securities or other financial instruments in this or in, in any other jurisdiction in which such solicitation or offer would be unlawful under the securities laws of such jurisdiction. All content is information of a general nature and does not address the circumstances of any particular individual or entity. None of the information constitutes professional and or financial advice, nor does any of the information constitute a comprehensive or complete statement of the matters discussed or the law relating thereto. There are risks associated with investing. Loss of principle is possible. Some high-risk investments may use leverage, which will accentuate gains and losses of securities or firms' past investment performances not a guarantee or predictor of future investment performance.